Hi everybody and welcome to another episode of Amiga Game Development by me, McGeezer. And I'm really pleased to bring you episode number 5 this week. Uh, this is split into two parts I think because it really took me a long time to actually do this one. And I've, I've kind of said two parts because if I need to do a second part because it kind of overruns or um, there's things that are not clear then I'll do them in that second part. But hopefully I might get away with just one part. We don't know yet. Um, see how it goes. See if people come back to me and say I haven't got a clue what I'm talking about. So quite a lot to get through on this one. It may go to about an hour and a half. I don't know yet. We're going to find out. It doesn't really matter how long it is as long as I get the information over. So in this episode we're going to be talking about structures, bitmaps and the copper. We're going to get really kind of into the Omega and... Uh, Hopefully we'll actually display a picture or an image on the Omega. So in order to do that, I've got to basically tell you about quite a few different things. So uh, onward we go. So this is what we're going to be covering. Uh, same same sort of thing. Uh, we'll start off with a recap, introduction to structures. We've kind of already touched on structures previously, I think in the second episode. I'm going to talk about bit planes. I'm going to talk about bit plane modulo which is quite important. We're going to look at color palettes. Um, we're going to delve a little deeper into the Omega hardware registers. I think we've touched on them previously, but we're going to look at them a uh, fair, fair bit in depth now. Uh, in particular, the hardware registers that control the, the, the bitmaps, or the display, I should say, and the, the palettes as well. We're going to be looking at uh, setting the palette registers and setting the bit plane registers and hopefully within this within this episode, like I say, it's part one, um, it may stretch into part two. We're going to actually display something on the screen, uh, which will be which will be good. So this episode is going to be quite heavy. Um, the first the first bit of it's going to be quite heavy kind of theory, and the back end of it's going to be assembler while being monarm and just kind of showing you through what's actually going on. And I'll be putting the source code up as usual, the PowerPoint splat, PowerPoint slides, slides, PowerPoint slides, and um, yeah, we'll 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 take it from there. So, a recap of what we touched on episode four. We talked about libraries, opening libraries, closed libraries, uh, and what was needed for that. So we talked about the exec library and how that is actually already available on the Amiga's boot up. We get a look at hex address four, and that gives you a point to the exec library. And we'll talk about the DOS library as, as well. We looked at allocating RAM and we looked at reading files in the Amiga. We looked at using Rob Northern Computing's Pro Packer, which was typically used back in the day. So we looked at an example of packing files and then we looked at using the the unpack uh, source code to actually unpack the, the, the pack file that we put in. Packing, unpacking, and what we did was is that we we ended up with a routine, uh, which was load and unpack file. And what it did was it, it effectively just took a file, a packed file, loaded it into RAM, and then sent you back a handle. Now a handle could be a number, but in this case, it's a memory address to say, right, this is where the information is that is um, that you're looking for, that is about this file that you've just loaded. And we're going to be coming on to quite a bit of that. So introduction to structures. So if you think, <clears throat> if you think about the types of objects that would make up a computer game. Now, when I say objects, I don't mean um, you know sprites and things like that, and ob game object. What I mean is, I mean the internals of the game and internals of the Amiga. And what I mean by that is I've split them down into resources and assets as examples. Now a resource would be something along the lines of just dealing with RAM. So allocating some RAM, maybe some chip RAM, which would give you a screen buffer. Now in a screen buffer you would put in you would put information in there which is actually displayed on the Omega screen. Or you might have allocate some RAM to create a data table. And the data table could be anything. It could be holding um, some could be just holding a a, a, um, a a sign table or a cosine table or something like that which we, which we will come on to but then you've got 
assets, which we've already touched on. We've loaded an asset uh, in a packed file and unpacked it. And from there, you can then derive more types of assets or structures. So if you imagine you've got a loaded file, a loaded um, IFF file, within that IFF file, there's going to be more information that can be gleaned from the file. And, and this, is, this is actually what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at, from an IFF file point of view, we're going to be pulling out the bitmap data and we're going to be pulling out the information that relates to the bitmap data. So what I mean by that is that we're going to be pulling out how big the how big the bitmap is, what's its width, what's its length, how many colors it has, um, how many bit planes it has, that type of thing. And we're going to put them into a structure which is easily usable later on for when we do come up to doing things like using the blitter. Uh, so it's so it you know it's the information can be quickly got at to work out how to blitz something on the screen. Within an IFF file as well, you might have a palette. In fact, you normally do have a palette, which makes up what goes with the bitmap. And, you know, an assets file might be an IFF file, but it might not be just a picture. It could be something along the lines of a tile map or a tile sheet, um, you know, something like that. Or you might have a sprite sheet, which is a kind of a, a a set of sprites the animation the animated sprites each one uh, that make up a sprite sheet I hope that makes sense so this is a what a structure might look like once you've loaded it into ram and you've kind of created this this structure so suppose you allocate a piece of ram in the amiga now the the end of the day the the Amiga will just give you, if you say, right, Amiga, Amiga West, give me some RAM. I want it to be this size. It will just hand it back or it won't hand it back if it doesn't have enough RAM. Now, we want to try and keep track of each time that we allocate some RAM. So what we do is we put this into structures. So because normally when you load a game, what you what you tend to do is you say, right, I'll, Amiga, can I have a bit of RAM? Can I have a bit of RAM for this? Can I have a bit of RAM for that? Can I have a bit of RAM for the for that and what you need to do is keep track of each of these bits of ram for various different reasons so this is just an example of us what allocating a piece of ram might look like so you've asked the amiga for some ram and what you typically want to know is you want to know what the starting address is of that ram so it's if it's give you some ram at between 70,000 hex and 80,000 hex you would store that in this long word at offset zero and normally you want to know the size of the amount of RAM that you allocated as well. So you're going to get the size. So it might be you wanted 8K. Well, you'd get 8192 in there, which is stored as a long word. You might also want to store the type of type of object that it is. Now, in this in this example here, I've set this this resource and RAM segment structure as object type zero, as you've seen there. But you know, if you've got an asset, you might have Type one or a screen buffer might be four, five, two, three, four, six, that type of thing. So we'd store that in there because, like I say, you you would load multiple. You would load. You would ask the Amiga for different types of objects, and maybe there's more than one or two of the same type of object. And so in that in that case, when there's more than one type of the same object, you might want to store an index to it as well. And that's what we that's what we're storing in that. In that long word there so the entirety of this structure here is made up of four long words and a long word as we found out in episode two is made up of um is made up of four bytes and so there we get 16 bytes that is the size of this particular structure here so what about the loaded file asset so previous previous file uh, previous slide looked at allocating ram but what about a loaded asset that we've loaded into ram now you might again you might say at offset zero we want the starting address of where the assets loaded typically that's what you would do you want to know the size of the asset that's been loaded and you're going to store the object type which would be a one and again you would have a handle so if this was the first type of this object you would, that will be zero if it's the second type of this object it will be one and you'd have these stored all all in a structure okay this is what a bitmap structure might look like. So you've, in this example, 
you have loaded an IFF file, loaded a packed and unpacked, loaded an IFF file into RAM, which has been packed and then it's been unpacked. So some of the things that you might store in this particular bitmap structure would be the starting address of the bitmap, the size of size and the bytes of the bitmap as well, the type of object, which will be three, an index. So you see that's common. All the ones I've put in purple there are all common to the different objects, the types that we have. Well, then you might, for this particular structure, you might have extra information that are related to the bitmap. And you might want to store the width in pixels. You might want to store the depth in pixels. Number of bit planes, as I explained, it might be one, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bit planes on, on AGA, which will give you 256 colors. Uh, number of colors, the bit plane modulo, as well and pointed to the bitmap data so yeah that's a, a good example of a, of a bitmap structure and one that we're going to actually be looking at as a, as a in practice really so a couple of things that should be going through your head at the minute what are bit planes and what is modulo which is what I'm going to explain right now so imagine well first of all this is the starting one of the starting rounds from Bomb Jack Beer Edition, which we're going to actually use as an example. So onward we go. Just need a drink to keep me refueled. So imagine we we have that um, that particular bitmap image in in RAM, and that image is made up of 32, is made up of five bit planes and the 32 colors. A bitmap is simply a, a set of data and the data is all kind of contiguous. Okay, and the data is either, it's just bytes of data and each bit that is part of the bytes means either the pixel is switched on or a pixel is switched off. So this here would be the first bit plane of that particular image and as you can see it looks very monochrome there's only it's all it's like it's all about it's blue and blue and black actually where it's monochrome you could say now with with if something's either switched on or off it can only and you can only effectively have two colors so that's why at the bottom here with one bit plane you can only get registers zero and one so as you can see we've just got black and blue here that is shown. Now, if we introduce bit plane number two, this is what this looks like here. So, with the second bit plane, we've got two to the power of two, which is four. So now we can address four colors. So bit planes and we've got one, one, two, two. So now, as you can see in the image, so this is the second bit plane is just in its monochrome version, and this is the bit plane overlapped. We can see. That we're now getting extra color in there. If we bring in the third bit plane, two to the power of two to the power of three or three to the power of two, I should say, gives you eight. And as you can see, we're getting more colors involved. Four, four to the power of two is sixteen. As you can see, we've addressed all of these colors up to here. Uh, but notice the bombs, which should be red. See the red, the, all these bombs here are not quite, every other colour in the image is actually is actually fine in the background. Um, and that is because there is no colours here that are actually set in the background. Because there's no part of the bitmap that affects it. If we introduce the last bit plane, and as we can see in this last bit plane, the only bits that are set are those of the bombs. So nothing else it's just the bombs that are set in there and as you can see when we introduce that bit plane it's able to color in these reds there doesn't seem to be any grays but the oh yes there is a little bit of gray but as you can see it completes the picture so by overlaying all of the bit planes together we f we can form up a picture of a certain number of certain number of colors and in this case it's 32 colors so there you go Bit plane modulo. So this is quite important. So 
hopefully I will explain this quite well. Imagine this, well, this picture is, is actually of this size. It's 224 pixels wide by 256 pixels in depth. Now, that is what the first bit plane looks like. And the bit plane is 28 bytes across. And I'll explain that in a second. The second bit plane sitting next to it is makes it 56 bytes across. And we add a third bit plane, becomes 84 bytes. Fourth bit plane, 112. Fifth bit plane. So the entire bit plane, so all the bit planes added together, is 140 bytes. So the modulo, which I'm going to do. So the bit plane width in bytes is equal to the pixel width divided by 8. So the pixel width is 224 divided by 8 equals 28 and as you can see each each bit plane is 28 bytes in size okay the bit plane modulo is equal to the bit plane width okay which is 28 multiplied by the number of bit planes minus 1 so we've got five bit planes minus 1 is 4 so 28 times 4 28 times 4 is 112 this effectively here is the size of the bit plane modulo. Okay, it's the effectively it comes from uh, the modulus, I believe, and it's the remainder. And this is actually quite important to the Amiga's display hardware. It needs this to understand how to position each bit plane. Okay, we we effectively um, will be looking at this in in just a second. But that is bit plane modulo. So I'm just going to come on to color palettes now and how these are, how these are referenced. This is probably most people will know this, but effectively, if you have red, green, blue, the if you're on an OCS or EGA Amiga, you have a 12 bit palette, okay, which gives you 4096 colors. So if you want a red, a red color, you've got uh, zero to zero to F, which is 15. Of green, 0 to F, 0 to F and blue, and you put them all together and you can have 4096 colors. On the AGA, you have a 24 bit palette, so it goes from 0 to 256 for your reds, green, and your blue. Okay, giving you a palette of 16.7 million colors. So if you wanted to set a 12 bit color, and you want to sell it to dark green, you would say you you effectively discard this this high order nibble here, and it only really takes into account the last three nibbles, which is the red and the green and the blue. So as you can see, red is set to zero, which means no red, and we're having a little bit of green uh, in this in this example, dark green, and we're having no blue, which gives us dark green. So and then we've got a mid green, so zero eight zero. And we've got a light green, which is zero F zero. And this is our our twenty four bit color size. And as you can see, we store these as long words. So we discard this high byte here. Full red will be FF, and orange will be FF eight eight zero, and yellow FF FF zero zero. I hope that makes sense. So this is just a little nod to really have a look at this, and we're going to we are going to be touching on it. But the Amiga back in its heyday uh, through Electronic Arts came up with the IFF uh, format, but the I ILBM IFF format stands for Interchangeable File Format, and we'll be looking at it when you actually create an IFF file. We'll be looking at what's actually stored in there. There'll be things like um, there'll be a body, which is the start of the bitmap data. There's a CMAP, which is the color map data. There's a BMHD header, which is the information that con that, is, that tells us about what the how to actually um, show the bitmap data. And we're going to be pausing all that information. But please, if you get a chance, have a look at this at the Wikipedia article, and it's pretty good. It's you know it it tells you everything you need to know to and what to find in an IFF file and it's not normally just you know just um 
just Amiga stuff. I think they did it. They did a, they used it for PC stuff as well. So t please take a take a look at, at that when you when you get a chance. So one of the Amiga's hardware registers. So we've touched on the different types of RAM, and what I've put in red here is what the hardware registers are. Now, typically, if you want the Amiga to do something, you you tell it to uh, you, you it generally involves writing something to one of the hardware registers or reading something back from one of the hardware registers and some of the hardware registers are write only some of them are read only we'll be coming on to that when it's relevant but i just wanted to point out that in the address ranges the bfd bfd f00 and the bfe bfe fo those are for the CIA chips, of which there's two of them in each Amiga, in every Amiga. And these things, uh, you're able to control things like the floppy disk drive. Uh, you're able to read things like the mouse and um, all kinds of other different types of things. These ones here, they're in the range of DFF000 to DFFFFF, are the hardware chip registers. Now, when I say hardware chip registers, what I mean is, is that in in the OCS Amigas, there was three custom chips: Denise, Agnes, and Paula. Paula was responsible for the sound. Uh, Agnes is responsible, I believe, for the copper and the blitter. Uh, Denise, I can't even remember what it's what it's um, responsible for, but it's probably responsible for something really important, like interrupts or something like that. And when you write information into these hardware registers, you are directly programming these chips here. And here's an example. If you want to set the background color of the of the display, so this is the, the so it's normally black, I believe, on the Amiga when you when you fire it up. Well, it's actually it's white when you fire up the Amiga. But if you want to change that to green, you typically you would typically use this instruction here: move w zero f zero to dff one eighty. That is the register. That is the color zero register so the example that we just had earlier on where we had a 32 color palette if you wanted to address color if you wanted to change color palette one so it goes zero one you would put something in dff 182 because it's a word size and the next register up is color one and then color two color two excuse me color three and so forth and forth and so forth so that's how you put in that's how you would change palettes on the Amiga's display I'll use the CIA example a lot of people know this but if you want to check this is a bit test instruction and if you look in any of the schematics of the Amiga you will see that uh, I think it's pin six um, of the joystick port is is kind of wired to this this CIA port here this this CIA chip and if you want to test the status of pressing the left mouse button you can do a bit test of, of pin number six I believe that's what it is and it will read back the status of what pin of what pin six is so when it's pressed it will be set to a I think it's a one or a zero actually and when it's not pressed it's set to a one. And that's effectively an example of the the of, of reading the hardware registers and writing your hardware registers in the Amiga. Okay, time for a drink. So, how do you set these particular registers? So, for color palettes, there's two ways to do it. You can do it in assembler, as I just mentioned, like this. You can do move if you want to set color zero to black. You would do move zero hash dollar zero 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 to, to DFF one eighty, and these are the different colors you could set by moving these values into them. Now the Amiga has a copper, and the other way to do it is to use the copper, and to do that, we can use this type of instruction here and this is a copper instruction this is a move copper instruction and what it's saying is for color register zero we just move this value and the copper does this a lot faster than what you can do it in assembler 
and we're probably going to find out why. But first of all, what the hell is the copper? This is an example. I'm just going to put a little tagline that I put up here. The copper can change most hardware registers in the Amiga at any point in the video display frame. This includes any vertical position and any horizontal position within four low res pixels. There's a reason for the four low res pixels. It's to do with timing. So in this example here, we've got the same image. And as you can see, we've got the bombs here that have been set to black. Now, this display, if you were playing the game, this display would, would be refreshed 50 times a second. By the by the Amiga's display and what the copper does is is that or what the Amiga does is is this it has this beam that runs across from the top left it starts off at the top left and it runs across to the right and then it wraps around and then it comes down to the next scan line and then it wraps around to the next scan line and it does this extremely quickly and what the copper can do is it's is it's actually hardwired into this display and it can control what actually happens with the display at various points. So in this example here, what I'm saying is, is that we've got a copper weight instruction. And the weight instruction can say wait for a vertical position or wait for a vertical line in the display or wait for a horizontal line in the display and then do something else. So we can say you can use a copper weight instruction and then use a copper move instruction. So what I'm saying here is I'm using a copper weight instruction. I'm saying right. Wait for line 160, which is A0, which is at this point here. And then I'm getting another copper instruction and I'm saying, right, change the value of the palette color, color sorry, of the color register 24, which is this red bomb here, and set it to black. Okay. And then 32 lines later, I've got another copper weight instruction, which is this C0 here. Wait for line 192. And I'm saying, okay, done with that. I want to set it back to red. So we reset color register 24 back to red. And that's effectively what it what it does in the display frame. But what the hell is a display frame? And I've got a video and I hope it plays well. And this is from the slow-mo guys. And I've always loved this video every time I see it. It's about three or four minutes long. But it just it gives a real good insight into what actually happens on a PAL display that's been refreshed 50 times a second or an NT, NTSC display which is 60 times a second or 60 frames a second. But hopefully it'll play fine and we'll... Hello there, my name's Gavin and welcome to this episode of the Slow Mo Guys, very oddly presented from my living room. A while ago, I made a video called How a Camera Works in Slow Mo and the response was great. So I thought a good natural progression to that video would be how a TV works in slow-mo. This is an 85 inch LCD TV and whenever I'm playing something on it or watching something on it, my eyes and brain are being misled and tricked, giving me the illusion of watching a moving object when in fact I'm just watching several still images just shown to me very, very fast. If I'm watching a film, I'm being shown 24 images every second and to my eyes that looks like I'm looking at a moving object when in fact I'm looking at 24 individual pictures. If I'm playing a game, it's the same except maybe 30 to 60 frames a second. And if I'm on a PC, it could be hundreds. <coughs> PC Master Race. But a TV like this is actually incapable of showing you one image and then a 24th of a second later, just switching all at once to the next image. And to illustrate this next point, I'm going to use a very old and very crap CRT TV. That stands for cathode ray tube. If you've ever seen one of these filmed, you may notice that it looks slightly different on camera than it does to your eye. Look at that. The reason it looks like this is because the shutter speed of this camera is out of sync with the refresh rate of this screen. The frame is constructed from the top to the bottom multiple times per second. That's 60 times in the US, 60 hertz. I've prepared for you some high speed footage that I shot a long time ago on the V2511 of this screen and this screen and some others. Um, a lot of it is Dan playing Super Mario on the NES extremely badly. Here's the TV and the cat played back at 25. This is how it would be perceived in real time. And now at 1600 frames a second, you can actually see the scan line moving from the top to the bottom. You'll notice that on a CRT screen, 
It's only the active line of pixels that's bright, and your persistence of vision will actually build that into a complete image. It's messing with my eyes, this. Drift <laughs> is like a dance floor. Oh, oh didn't even make it past <laughs> the first guy. Slowed all the way down to 2,500 frames a second, you can now differentiate each individual frame being built from top to bottom. It takes an extremely fast camera to see that each frame is built line by line from top to bottom, but it takes an even faster camera to see that each line is drawn from left to right. Slowed down to 28,500 frames a second, we're now seeing glimpses of that, but we do need to go even slower. This is now 118,000 frames a second. I'm gonna put the stats up for you here so you can see the actual amount of time that it took. And you can see now that the line is being drawn from left to right on the screen. Now at 146,000 frames a second. To gain perspective on just how slow this actually is, you can see the exact time I shot this. So this is hours, it was just past midnight, 23 minutes, 41 seconds. This is a tenth of a second, a hundredth of a second, one thousandth of a second or a millisecond. And then over here you've got a ten thousandth of a second, a hundred thousandth of a second, and this unit here is the millionth of a second or a microsecond. We are now at 380,000 frames a second as our recording frame rate. That is the highest frame rate we've ever shot so far on this channel. And using this information, here's a little bonus fact. A CRT screen can draw Mario's moustache in less than a 380,000th of a second. That is some seriously fast facial hair. And if you're wondering why this footage looks extremely mucky and blurry, it's because the resolution is only 256 by 128, which plonked into a 4K frame is this big. <laughs> that CRT screen is standard def. This is a 4K. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show you with the with regards to the how the display is actually made up, and it goes as the guys showed, it goes from left to right, downwards. Um, when it gets to the bottom, it flips right back up to the top of the screen, and up top to the top of the display, and then that is called the vertical blanking period. Okay, so hopefully that made sense. Uh, might not have at the minute, but later on down the line, uh, when we come on to more more advanced things, um, it will come in handy uh, without a doubt. <clears throat> so what I want to talk about is some more hardware registers, and in this in in this example here, we've, uh, we're going to be looking at the bit planes. We've already looked at the palette registers, so colors 0 through to 31. The registers in green are the ones that we're actually going to touch upon. And I'm just going to go down these now and, and explain what they are. Um, this one here is the display window start. Uh, we will come on to that later. This is display window stop. And these two reg these two registers here control the the display opening top left and the display uh, closing at top of bottom right on the Amiga. Data fetch start and data fetch stop. Those are what's those are on the um, those are when the custom chips actually start to bring in information to the bitmap information to actually start beginning displaying things on the Amiga on the actual display. Uh, so we'll cover those later because they're a little bit advanced. DMA con we will cover as well as as well as interrupt enable. Bit plane control zero we will cover. Now this this actually sets the number of bit planes that that we want to display, and we know what that information is because we've looked at it and we'll be able to glean that information from uh, the, an IFF file because that's where that is stored. Bit plane control register one and bit plane control register two. Uh, those are for the things like scrolling and things like that. So we'll and sprite priorities. We'll be able to look at those in a bit a bit depth later. Bit plane one modulo and bit plane two modulo. We've already looked at working out those, so those should be no no problem. Fetch mode we'll be looking at later, and this this is the this is the copper copper control registers here. And this is the where you're pointing your copper to, 
and this is what you tell this is what you effectively write to to tell the copper to start to start working all these registers here are to do with where the bit planes are pointing okay so these are word size as well and you've got bit plane bit plane pointer one high high word and bit plane pointer two uh, bit plane pointer one low word so those make up uh, an address in the Amiga's chip RAM and this is the same for bit plane two bit plane three four five six seven and eight just take these uh, just take these off so just to give you an example what we talked about there the um, this is the this should not say bit plane modulo it should say bit plane it should should just say how the bit planes are displayed so imagine we have some bitmap data uh, loaded in the Amiga and it's pointing at a uh, chip chip RAM address 50,000 what we would effectively do is set bit plane pointer 1 to 50,000 we'd set bit plane pointer 2 28 bytes further forward which is 1c in hex and we point that to 50,000 5001c for bit plane 3 28 bytes again 4 5 and that's how we would work that's how we would tell the Amiga to say that these are where our bit planes all start okay you would set these registers here you also want to set the modulo which we worked out because the modulo is 112 for this particular image and that was 112 we would just set these registers here and the number of bit planes which we set which is uh, that is set to five it's great stuff that's how we would do that so what we're going to do now is actually look at how to put this into practice and the these are effectively what I will call the functions that we've that we're going to be creating now we've already created the first function in episode 4 because that was AGD load pa load packed asset and if you remember what we did is we got a pointer back or a, a, a an address back to where our loaded asset was in RAM and you know we, we're going to we're going to be touching back on that as well and what we did is we supplied a couple of arguments we said right we want to load this packed asset and unpack it and this is the file name which we set in a0 and this is the memory type of that where we want to load it to so into chip RAM or fast RAM or we're not bothered which RAM it was so what we're going to do we've got some examples here we've got four uh, one two three four yeah and we're going to just run through them in assembler and see how they're coded so we've the first one that we've got is agd allocate resource now if you remember allocate resource uh, was is just simply give me some ram okay and we just need one we need two uh, parameters for that sorry this d0 should be kind of over here in D0, we're going to specify the amount of RAM that we would like. And in D1, we're going to specify the type of RAM that we like. And coming back into D0, we're going to create uh, we're going to create a pointer to the structure. If you remember the structure that we created with the address, the size, the index, and the type, well, we're going to create a we're going to create a structure. And what is returned is a pointer to that structure, which we can then easily get information from in our game so we're going to look at that right now <clears throat> and what I'll need to do unfortunately is fire up VMware workstation so I rebooted my computer before I did this Okay, so what we have, um, just just to just to let you guys know, what I've done is I've created these folders here. So in order to do this, you do open open folder as workspace, and then you can find a folder in the directories, 
and I've just set that to there, Amiga Game Dev. And what happens is Notepad++ will read, will just read these as folders and you can look at each one. So in each of these examples, 5A, B, C and D, those relate to what we have here, A, B, C and D. Okay. So as you can see in the source code of the main, we're seeing episode 5, slide 18, part 8. This builds on episode number 4 and shows how to allocate a chunk of RAM. And we're seeing the P resource, which we get back in D0. That should say here. AGD allocate resource. Number of bytes and then the memory type. Okay. Cool. One thing I have done as well, what you would need to do is set in the... When this compiles... You just need to set the parameters in the build script to tell it where the new main is. Okay. So you will need to set you will need to set it there for the include. Because there's an extra folder. And you will need to set it there as well. So it's C colon slash development slash mega game dev slash episode five and then A, B, C or D. And then that's when you and then you will need to change it for each one that you download so i'm just going to set these back to 5a so that we're working on the right one and as we can see that that compiled fine and what we're going to do is bring up our old trusty friend monam and take a look at what this is doing So we're just going to come down. Now this is the file. This is the DOS library open. And as you can see here, I've just loaded into A0. There's a file name which it is going to load and unpack, which is called safk emblem.rnc. So this is from episode four. We're just going to load that up. And quite rightly, we've got a result that's come back. Now, one thing I have changed is that this returns a structure so can you remember in the slides when I said we want to come back to a pointer to a structure well this is that's this is one of those structures here so what we have is we have 14BD0 which is the address of the loaded file and we have the size which is D13C D13C of the file and then we've got the type and then the index number so what we're going to do is just going to take a look at 14B D0, which is the address of the loaded file. 14B D0. And sure enough, what we see there is that is an IFF file. We can tell that because it starts with form and it's got ILBM, BMHD, bitmap header, and that's a color palette in there with CMAP. So that is definitely our loaded asset, our loaded and unpacked asset. So we test D0, was it okay? Yes, it was. So now this here, we're gonna allocate some RAM. And the amount of RAM we're gonna allocate is 1000 in hex, which happens to be 4K, 4096 bytes. And the RAM type that we're gonna want is chip RAM, which is two, or MMF chip. And this new function that I've created here is called AGD allocate resource. And when I go into here, we're just going to trace down this. And this is a call to allocate memory. Did it give me some memory? Yes, it did, because D0 is not negative. And what we've now got is this create new handle. Now, this is what creates the structures in RAM. So I'm just going to go and we're going to look at the source code for this. I'm just going to trace and show you what it's actually going to do. So 13 in D7 is the maximum number of structures that will be created. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about this. This is where things might be, this is why it might need a second episode or a second part, I should say. <clears throat> so I want this to be quite clear. And Come to where it is. Whoops, allocate. Oh, 
Yeah, so here, what what it's doing, this is now creating creating the the structure. So the address, the size, the type, and the index. And like I say, we're going to look at the source code to this. And we're going to move D5, which is the address, into the address. So that is where it allocated our RAM to one D10. And we're going to move D6. That's the size in D6. We're going to move that into the size. So there you can see the structure has been created there. And as you can see, a zero is pointing to it. We're just going to pop that back to D1 and fetch it back. So that's what that AGD allocate resource function did. Well, we're going to just keep tracing and then that is the function done. So we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail, I think. So let's take a look. So what I've done in the actual assembler, I've created these additional additional files. So what we've got for the handles, which we'll start on first, I've created this handles.i. So the handles.include. And all this has is, is just a load of constants. And what we've got is we've got a different resource types, which we numbered as per the slides. So an asset is is labeled as zero, a resource is labeled as one, a bitmap is two, palette three, a screen buffer is four. And what I'm doing is, I'm going to show you what these look like. Size structure resource is 16 bytes, and the size structure bitmap 32. We're going to come on to the bitmap. And what we've also got is just some maximum structure sizes here. So this, when I say this, this is the maximum number that can be allocated. And then what's most important is just, this is what this, if you remember in the slide, what the table looked like. And this is what I was particularly interested in showing you. So the address is equal to zero. So that is an offset of zero bytes. The size is four. So if you remember, the address is a long word. So a long word's four bytes. So four, four bytes after the start will be which is where the size comes in. So that's why that's set to four. And then another four bytes after that, we've set to the resource type. And 12 bytes after that, we've put in the index. Hopefully this will become clear as, as you, you guys do it. In handles.dat, which also gets included, we've got some tables. Now on the tables, what we're doing is, is we're saying, okay, for the, each type that we have, we're having to create, a, we're creating a pointer to where the structures are. So what we're doing here effectively is saying this is memory space for where that those structured, those structure information will get created. So we're saying, right, we want a maximum resource structs. So we're repeating that. And the number there is 20. So the maximum number of structures we can have here is 20. And all I'm doing here is, is I'm just saying the size that we have, which is this here. So the four long words, which equals 16. We're just saying, right, allocate 16 bytes of minus one, okay, in there. And that's all we're doing. We're just creating space for our structures to be filled in. That's effectively all we're doing. And the what this resource table does is it says, right, if I send it, if I want a, a handle of a type of resource, it indexes to this resources, which is here. And then it needs to know the size, which is likely 16. So it knows how to index to the which to which structure it needs to get to. So I'm just going to bring up the handles.asm. And if we look at this, so this is a new function I've created. Create a new global handle or resource input. D0 is the resource type to return. And output is the D0. Actually, D0 should just be the handle pointer, I believe. But we'll, we'll, we'll run through it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to see it. Uh, well, I'm just going to run through this, really. So the first thing we do is we set a counter to 0. And we say the maximum number of handles that can be 
uh, or structures that can be created. I should say structures. And we put that in D7. So if we've already allocated, which I think is 20, I think this is set to 20, then it can't allocate anymore. We've run out of memory or something like that. You know, we just, we, we don't allow it to do that. We, it's an error condition. We load effective address the resource table, which is here. And what we do, we do a LSL number three. Well, LSL number three, logic shift left, means multiply whatever you've got in DO by eight. Remember about our bit shifting, that's what that does. And then it adds the number to A0. So what effectively you do is, you say, right, I want A0 to be pointing to either here, here, here. So if I, if I put D0, zero, if I said D0 to 0, it would point to this. If I said D0 to 1, it will point to this one. If I said D0 to 2, it will point to this one. And that's because you've got a long word here, which is 4. So I'm declaring long. And you've got another long word here, which is 8. So therefore, if you're multiplying by 8, you get 1 times 8 is going to be in there. And 16 will be there. Hopefully that is clear. Okay, so <clears throat> what we do, so we then say get the structure size. Now the structure size will be this value. So what is in here? And then we're putting that in D0 and then we say get the address of the structure. Okay, that is this value here. So what will happen is that a0, so we're moving, we dereference in, dereferencing a0 and putting it in the a0 register. So a0, if we put in 1, would effectively point to here. That is where a0 will point to if we had d0 as 1. So it's at the kind of the start of this structure, it's at the start of the resources structure. And then what we do, and we've went through this before, we go into a loop. And we say, right, which structure is free? And we, all we simply do with that is we say, right, we testing, we dereferencing the first word of the structure. And if it's minus or is set to minus one, then it's free. It's free. We can allocate it. So if we look here, by default, the structures are all set to minus one. So the first time it runs, it's going to come up and go, well, this is a free structure. I'm going to allocate it. So what it does is it says, right, okay, I found one that's free. And it come, jumps to jumps to allocate. And it moves D6 into D0. Now D6, as we say, as we, if we have a look, we set this as a counter. That is the counter there. Now if it isn't free, if the structure is already used, we simply add one to D0. Uh, sorry, we add one to D6 and we keep counting up until we find one that is actually free. And that's all that is doing. That's all that create new handle is actually doing that, that particular function. It isn't super important that you know this all at the minute. And it will become clear. Uh, and I guess it'll become clear when you guys actually go and debug it and you'll see you'll see exactly how how it's going on. It's it's quite a difficult thing to explain this, really is. Um so what we've now got is if we So what I've done is I've included handles.i, we've got loaders, we've got unpack, and we've got handle which is there which we've included. Now in loader I, so this is what we previously did, load packed asset. What I've also created is this AGD allocate resource. So this is just allocating some RAM, and this is really, really super simple. So this is what we should have, or something similar to what we had on our, on our slide. So allocate resource, D0, I should say P, 
So we return a pointer to the structure and size in day zero, memory type in day one. Yes, that looks round about right. It is. And what we do is we allocate allocate the amount of RAM that's in day zero. That's what this does here. It tests to see if it's fine. If it was, it moves the pointer to the RAM in day five. Then we get a new handle of type resource and we say agd create new handle we get the we get the pointer to the structure back in a zero and then we set the values in the structure so as you can see there d5 is going into the address d6 is going to size d0 is the index and we just set the, the resource type into the, into the type as well and then what it does is it returns the structure the structure pointer back to day zero and that is it okay cool so i'm just going to load up in fact i'm going to run through that again and debug it and hopefully it will be fine see it fine it should be understandable So we're opening the library, we're loading our file and unpacking it. It's all fine. And here, saying we want to allocate 4K. We're going to allocate the resource. Create a new handle. And as you can see, we've got a new handle. Because A0 is pointing to all the Fs, and we're just going to set the values right there. And we return the pointer in D0, which is fine. That is it. Good stuff. Okay, next example, what we've got. This is get bitmap dimensions. So we're getting a little bit bolder now. So what I'll do is I'll just open this one. And what I will need to do is just set up and change this from 5A to 5B. B, save. Okay, to that, as you can see, it's compiled. And what we've done in this one, so we haven't touched the, we haven't touched handle.esm, but as you can see, what I've included is this new bitmap.esm. And when I come down the code, we've got the same thing that we had previously. We've took the allocate resource out, but all I've done is I've just replaced it with this, this new function. Get the dimensions of the bitmap okay get bitmap dimensions and what i'm going to do is i'm going to just trace through this and it doesn't really matter what what the contents of the iff file are because i can explain that later but i just want to show you what i'm doing by creating the structure that is the important bit at the minute so i'm just going to debug this so effectively what we've done is we're going to now load a file load our our iff file now we're going to pick out the bitmap dimension so if you remember about the modulo uh, was it yeah it was the modulo size the um, number of colors that type that type of thing so here we go we're just as usual load our packed asset and what we're going to do is we're going to move oops going to move this up slightly and what we did there is we stored the return handle so the pointer to where our iff file is being loaded 14 bd0 14 bd0 and that as you can see because it begins with form if you look at any of them that's what it begins with now in our function 
we're going to see a right. So we've just put that A1, 14 BDO, and we're going to get the address of the IFF file in A1. So when I go and look at A1, A1 now points to the IFF file that we loaded and unpacked. So when we look at get bitmap dimensions, we see that we've got this pointer in A1. That's how that's read there. And what we're going to do is we're just going to say OK. We're going to go and look at this. Uh, and that is not gone as I expected it to. Let me try that again. That hasn't done what I expected it to do. So we're going to load the packed asset, it's stored in D0, and we're going to get the pointer to the IFF file in A1, which I've done, and we're just going to trace here, we're going to get a new handle, ah yes, I see why that, believe that, why that didn't work the way it should have. So what I'm, what this is actually doing, this compare instruction. This compare is in instruction is waiting to see. It is looking for this BMHD header. Okay. And we can see what it's doing. If I just keep tracing, and we, if you look up here, we'll see that now year one dereferenced. Uh, now it contains BMHD. So there you go. It has done that. <clears throat> okay. Now what we have in A0 is our structure. Now I'm just going to run through this. What this is effectively going to do is create us a, a it's going to get all of the dimensions of the IFF file, which we're going to dissect on a later episode, and put them into this structure. Okay. Um, we've got the address. We've got the. Uh, oh, let me let me check what this is. In fact, you know what? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna let it populate this stuff, and we'll we'll work out what it is. I'm just gonna keep tracing down. I'm gonna just set a break point there. And that is set the address of the body in there. And we return the structure handle. Great. So the structure handle, which is set to C36F88. If we look at our, our function, that is what has been returned there. It's the pointer to the structure handle. Okay. Now what I'm going to do. I'm just going to look at what has been created in the structure and you'll see what it is. Okay, so if we look in handles.i this is the this is the structure and the offsets. So I'll just bring monam back up. Reduce the size of our screen slightly here. Just shift this along. Okay. So, as we mentioned earlier, the first 16 bytes is to do with first four bytes here is the, just the global structure. So that's the address of the asset. 
that is the size which is set to 14 that is the type and that is the index but these ones here which is 16 bytes in that is 100 and set to hex 140 now that has been set to the bitmap width okay so if we say what 140 equals that's 320 320 pixels if we look at the depth okay which is 18 and we say 1 will be so that is 267 now if we look at 20 in which is here we can see that this has five bit planes and if we look at the next word along which is 22 we can see that that has 20 or hex 20 colors which is 32 colors which would make sense and guess what we have the bit plane modulo which we worked out and that is set to year zero which is 160 year zero is 160 yes and what we've also got is the bitmap body so we've stored the bitmap body as well which is 14c6c 14c6c and that is the start of the bitmap bitmap data it's actually there but that is the start of it in the iff file there so i really just wanted to show you what how what's actually going on there with with creating these structures so we're now going to go on and do the palettes as well and to do that we'll just fire up the third part and again we just need to change the It changes to 5C, 5C, save, and OK, and that is compiled fine. So in this example now, we're going to be looking at the palette. So we're going to, very similar to the bitmap, we're just going to say, we send in the, the point to the loaded file, and what we get back is a palette. So we look in handles.i we'll see that all we have here is where the palette starts okay because an iff file can have you know 32 colors 64 colors 256 colors that can generate quite a big structure <clears throat> so what i've done is i've just set that to start the palette at 16 16 bytes inside the structure and I've set the size to be a maximum of 144 bytes. And that's what that is there. So what I'll do, I'll just take a look at palette.asm. And if you remember, when we looked at the, the IFF file, you may have seen a, a CMAP header. And that is where the color map starts and we've got the same sort of thing as we did in the bitmap header but what this is doing here this is taking all of the palette that is stored in the in the iff file and making it copper friendly so that's what this piece of code here is doing so Rather than label the point, I'm just going to quickly compile it and then I'm going to show you what it will look like by just looking at the structure that we get back and then it should become apparent. Oops, I've done it again. So what we're going to do, open our libraries, we're going to load our asset, we're going to store it, store our pointer to our bitmap, and then we're going to get the bitmap dimensions. So those are our bitmap dimensions. And now what we're going to do is we're going to get our palette from the loaded file as well. So in A1, as you will see, that is the start of the file. 
and we're going to say call this function get bitmap palette and that is returned in d0 a structure and as you can see the first 16 bytes again memory the memory pointer and the size which is got offset to 60 60 bytes for the palette and the type of asset which is 3 and the index because this is the index is 0 because this is the first palette that we've actually created and then what we have from this point here you'll notice that all of these values here all of the high nibble is always set to 0 and that is a sure sign that that is a color palette so this is the color palette for the image that we're loading and when we see FFFs that means the color palette is loaded it is finished and what we should find here is that there is actually 32 of these because there's 32 colors in the in the image it's 32 words so that's great we've done that so now what we're going to do is just load the final part and we're going to look at main now with this one things we'll get I need to explain things about how the copper actually works so in order to use a copper list it has to be stored in chip RAM okay there's a reason why they call it chip RAM it's because the um, because the custom chips in the Amiga are kind of wired into the chip RAM into the chip RAM and if you want to display an image on the screen if you want to blitz something if you want to use the copper for something anything that it's manipulating always has to be in chip ram if you're storing things like data tables things like that they don't have to be in chip ram because you're not using the custom chips to access them so if we're going to create a copper what we need to do is you is put the copper list into chip memory so as i'd mentioned what we're going to do is we'll just compile this up and i'm just going to trace this and i'm going to show you what it actually looks like <clears throat> so here we go Open those libraries load our file get our bitmap dimensions get our bitmap palette so here what i'm doing we're calling the allocate resource and we're saying right we want 1k and the number 2 says which is here give me some chip ram okay allocate resource and we just say right give me some chip ram and what it's done is is it's brought me back this structure pointer and as you can see the structure 1D918, 1D918, that is where our copper list is going to go. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, again, copper point at origin, the A1. And what we're going to do, as you can see, A1 is pointing to the start here and we're just going to start creating the copper list you'll see it actually start appearing in here and we so there we're doing the display windows and then we're doing the data fetch and doing other things and then we're loading the palette so this is the palette bean so you see those 180s 182s 184 that is loading the color palette into the copper so there you'll see so this is 180 so that, that refers to dff 180 dff 182 dff 184 so these are all copper move instructions 
and you'll see that they'll all go down. So we're loading the pallet. And what this is doing here, this 4801, that is saying, wait for line, hex. 48, which means wait for line, scan line, 72. And then what we're doing is we're going to add the bit play modulo. So as you can see, 108, 108 have been set to A0. That is the bit plane modulo registers. And now what we're doing is we're setting the bit plane control registers. So you see that 105 there, that is saying that this, this has five bit planes. For now, we're just setting bit plane control one and bit plane control two to zero, which is fine. And now what we're going to do is set the bit plane registers. So that's what that little function does here. So we're setting bit plane one, bit plane two, bit plane three, bit plane four, bit plane five. Now to end the copper, copper list, you put this long word in here, FFFF, FFFA. And that is the end of the copper list. Now in order to start the copper list, you need to do these these things here and I'm not going to go through all of them but effectively what you'll find is you need to um, you need to shut down the system and shut down all interrupts in the system and and then start the actual copper now watch what happens when I use monarm when I try to do that it's gone because I've shut down the some key parts of the system it means that we can't actually debug that because we've lost we've told the system to shut down and because monam is running on the Amiga on the Amiga it means we've we've broken monam so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you what the code looks like and we're seeing Clear all of our DMA channels, which we'll come on to. Clear interrupts, clear pending requests. And we're going to point our copper. And we're loading it into these, these hardware registers here. We're starting the copper and we're starting DMA. At the moment, it doesn't matter what these do. That isn't important. It's the fact, because typically these are the things that pretty much any Amiga game that takes hold of the system will do. It's these types of things it will do. And then all I'm doing here, if you remember from the slides, bit test number six on BFE001, if it's not equal, go to the mouse. That is going to go into a loop until the mouse button is pressed. Now, the image that we're loading is here. So let's give this a try. With a bit of luck, we should see an image. And how about that? Wonderful. That is the one of my that is an image from one of my favourite games, uh, Next Machina on the PS4, which is heavily influenced by Robotron and Eugene Jarvis. Superb. And the other image, which we just change, soft emblem. And let's see what that looks like. So this is the image that was 267, 267 lines in depth. Now you'll see that it doesn't matter with how many bit planes the, the image has, how many colors it has. The routine that we've created is, is going to handle all of that because it looks in the IFF file and then it creates these structures and it just says right display it and it's so what we've done we've created a routine to handle kind of any eventuality of an IFF file so hopefully that did make sense we've created these structures I'm going to I'm, these, we've created these functions I'm going to upload all of the source code onto Omega Game Dev I'll just make this into this and some useful resources for me is beer. 
that is my useful resources and I've needed some for doing this episode um, so if you feel kindness in your heart and you want to send me some beer please do so via a donation um, I'm thinking about starting up a patron site um, but if you go to amigagamedev.com you can there's a little donate button there maybe donate me a beer I'd really appreciate it um, as always you can catch me on Facebook at the link here and you can get me on Discord as well I suspect that this episode is going to cause a bit of confusion um, which is why I put in the part 2 as well to kind of tidy up and explain things later on should I need to so apart from that I'm going to enjoy some more of these things on the Saturday night and thanks for watching I appreciate it um, I just want to say thanks as well to Omega Bill this week who done a fantastic video of uh, Rygar unboxing and the interview that we did I just want to say thanks to Omega Bill and thanks to the community and thanks for giving the nod to Omega Game Dev really really sort of really um really made us proud to be working on the Omega and I appreciate it so thanks for watching guys uh, subscribe to the channel um, or come and visit me on any of these mediums here and I'll answer your questions or even just for a chat you know I do there's got quite a few people on discord just come on for a chat it's really nice of them please do please have a pop in and say hi I'll see you later